Welcome back to this latest episode of Japan's Top Business Interviews. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Story, the president of Dale Kenny Training Tokyo Japan. And my special guest today is Professor Jody Ono, who is a specially appointed professor at the Sotsubashi Business School in the ICS. Jody, welcome. Thank you very much, Greg. Okay, great pleasure, Jody. Thank you. So, Jody, you know, you're very uh, well spoken of. I wasn't able to attend a luncheon that you gave a talk at recently, but I heard from all the people who attended that were really, really impressed with your approach on leadership. So maybe we can start with your definition of leadership. Certainly. So um, as as you mentioned, I, um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm teaching leadership development at uh, one of Japan's top business schools. And I this process of learning how to teach leadership development has brought me to a certain definition of how I believe uh, leadership should be considered and cultivated in people now. And that is um, that leadership is an invitation to engage in change. An invitation to engage in change. What, what made you come to that particular definition? It's an unusual one. I've never heard that before. It's very fresh, very original, Thank you. which we like on this show. What made you come to that? How did you come to that conclusion? That's quite interesting. Well, it has the elements that I think the, the essentials that I believe are important for self-developing one's own leadership. So, for example, the word invitation, um, there's nothing directive about it. It's an offer. Uh, and to engage is to, uh, to act. Uh, so it's a participation, it's a con there's a contribution involved. Um, there's um, agency required. And then, of course, change. Is, is critical for leadership because without change, uh, one might be uh, wondering what we're leading for. Right. Okay. Thank you. Very good. So how is it you're here in Tokyo teaching at Hisotsubashi, and it's very, as you say, one of the most prestigious universities in Japan. How did you get here? Well, it, it is, <laughs> I won't go on too long, but it is a story and it's quite roundabout. I would say that unlike others um, who, who are sort of doing what I'm doing here, um, I am not a Japan-focused uh, professional, or I, ha I was not until quite recently. I started out in Europe. Uh, I spent about 20 years in Europe. Uh, working on uh, international development projects and educational settings, mainly university settings, uh, specialized in, more in the area of public policy. Uh, I this was is as a researcher, as an academic, or no, as I a was not consultant, or I was basically um, working in the uh, pu private foundation sector to uh, build and develop think tanks in Hi. economic research. Okay. Uh, I did that for about 10 years based in Stockholm. And I think the, the I took two things away from that, that very, very rich experience, um, many more than two things, but related to leadership development, these are the two things. One is that I received very, very good mentorship. Uh, and that uh, has stayed with me all along through my career has played a critical role in my ability, uh, in my it, it, my sense of my own capacities, and uh, to understand you know my constraints as well as my strength, which I think is very very important. And, and the other thing was that it gave me access to top level, executive level leaders um, with whom I was engaging um, quite frequently. So I got a front row seat. I was not, I was quite junior at that time. I was still learning. I hadn't yet done, I have two master's degrees. I, I hadn't yet done the second one, which is in public policy. Uh, I was still kind of shaping myself, figuring out where I was headed. But the exposure to, I got very lucky. I was exposed to very, very good leaders at an early age. Mm. And I think f <laughs> that's something, unfortunately, a lot of people don't get. And it was... What was good about them? When you uh, say that, you know, that's mm -hmm. a, a yeah. very broad statement. Yes. Uh, from that, at that yes. young age, you noticed, oh, these are really good leaders. Yes. What did that actually translate into for you? You know, I don't even think I realized it at the time. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but now when I look back, mm -hmm. I can see, okay, these were actually really good leaders. So um, mainly uh, they were values-based, mm -hmm. they were purpose-driven, mm -hmm. and they were developmental of others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably, I mean, all those three things, you need to have all those things going on. That's interesting because often, you know, uh, we teach a program called Leadership Training for Managers in Japan. Mm -hmm. And one of the big issues, and you flagged this in an email to me, mm -hmm. that often in Japan, managers manage and don't lead. And there's this gap between what is management, what is leadership. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about what your thoughts are on that? What's the difference between a leader and a manager? Well, there's so much written on this and there's so much scholarship on the distinction between leadership and management. Um, and that distinction remains well in place in, uh, you know, in, in terms of the management and leadership fields. It's very clear to the, the scholars and the thinkers mm. who are kind of working with these all the time. But in workplace realities, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very hard to hold the line of that mm -hmm. distinction. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, uh, management is about... In my view, it's about the wise allocation of resources. Mm -hmm. And those those resources could be many different kinds. It could be people, it could be money, mm -hmm. it could be mm -hmm. time, it could be mm -hmm. physical mm -hmm. assets. So mm -hmm. so um, it's about, you know, how are we using those resources and are we are we planning our mm -hmm. our use? Are we are we are are we checking our use? Mm -hmm. Are we are we, you know, verifying that we're making good choices about all the so that's a obviously a business critical mm -hmm. exercise. Mm -hmm. And I would never kind of put leadership above management in terms of, you know, a requirement for um, mm -hmm. doing good business. Mm -hmm. But leadership is is all about relationships. Mm -hmm. It's about people. When I say relationships, it doesn't mean I don't, I'm not, I'm not talking about business connections. Okay? okay. I'm talking about the ability of a person to relate to other people. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the, core, when, when we talk about relationship mm -hmm. or relational abilities, mm -hmm. it means, can I actually connect with you? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, leadership to me is about being able to invite people credibly mm -hmm. to join you mm -hmm. uh, in some kind of endeavor that moves people from one place to another or mm -hmm. moves an organization from one mm -hmm. place to another or brings about something new. Okay, great. Thank you. And thinking about, uh, you know, your, your, your background, you spent 20 years in Europe. Now, for an American, that's unique anyway, isn't it? Not that many Americans spend that much time out yeah. of the States. So you're obviously, you know, you've had a very broad experience. Uh, when did you get to Japan and how did you manage to – why are you in Japan, I guess, is a simple question. So when I arrived uh, with my family here in 2014 uh, to Tokyo – I brought with me a course that I had learned to teach at Texas A&M University mm. in leadership and development. So I've heard the name, but what does Texas A&M stand for? It's It started out as the College of Agricultural and Mechanical Engineering right. uh, uh, in the state of Texas right, right. Uh, in the U.S., and we lived there for seven years. Um, during which time I worked at um, the policy school there, which is a George H.W. Bush School of Government. Uh, I also worked at, uh, the, for the George um, Bush Presidential Library. But then I joined the Texas A&M Corps of Cadets as an instructor in the leadership development program. Mm, okay. And then to Japan, right? Yes. So uh, you've been teaching in Japan for, what, the last seven years or so, I think yes. you said, right? So what did you notice about you've developed a, a program on, on leadership based on basically European Western models, I guess. How is that model done in terms of translating into Japan? Well, first of all, um, the, the students that I teach at Hitsubashi are a global group of students. Okay. Uh, only about 10% usually of our MBA class are Japanese. Right. So I am teaching to a very, very diverse group of diverse people. Diverse group, yeah, right. It is largely Asian, though. Mm. Mo um, mostly our students from are from countries all over Asia. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, um, yes, in, it has been in some ways a challenge to, especially when I started out, to, to try and, you know, superimpose, if you will, you know, these kind of Western hatched uh, theories yeah. of, of leadership um, and how it is practiced 
onto um, existing mental models um, mm -hmm. coming from edu educational systems mm -hmm. in Asia. Mm -hmm. so, so that, I think, was a challenge that I initially underestimated. And, in, and I really set about, uh, very intentionally, trying to find the essence of what I wanted my students to understand about leadership. And so to some extent, you know, I draw upon what I think are really, really good uh, ways of thinking about leadership. Um, but to me, the most important factor in leadership development is uh, a personal commitment to develop oneself as mm -hmm. a leader. Mm -hmm. So if, if a person hasn't made that commitment and also doesn't have a full understanding of what that commitment really means, um, we, our leadership will be, uh, you know, quite probably inauthentic and superficial. In Japan, a lot of uh, leadership training per se is not what we would call training. It's on the job training in the yes. sense of it's not academic, it's not formal. It's observing yes. what your boss has done and then copying that. Yes. So <clears throat> we often, we do the leadership training here. We often find there's quite a big gap in knowledge of some of the fundamentals of leadership, like yes. they don't know how to delegate, they don't know how to handle mistakes, not good on the coaching. There are certain things you'd expect which are not actually there, and that's why we're training them to have those things. But what has been your experience about things like, um, you know, gaps that you would see that aren't actually there that you would expect to actually have in place in Japan? Well, the, the first big one is this distinction between management and leadership because mm -hmm. they do use those terms interchangeably. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there right away, there, there you've got a really, really big wall to climb mm -hmm. because um, that has to be thing one mm -hmm. for, for uh, anyone considering undertaking, developing themselves as a leader to, to understand. But of course, there are other components. For example... Authenticity, right? Everyone mm -hmm. talks about authentic leadership now, and that's become the gold standard, and we're all supposed to be authentic leaders. And um, unfortunately, um, authenticity is, is kind of a hard sell in, in um, this part of the world because, because it's mis the, the concept is misunderstood. And once I explain to the students what authenticity is really supposed to be, then they completely understand. What's it supposed to be? Okay, so it's mostly thought of as just be yourself as a leader, you know? Be a dictator and be authentic, you'll be fine. Yeah, I mean, it just means just be yourself. And that's not um, really that's not really what authenticity is uh, in terms of leadership development. So basically, authenticity supposes that that you have done some really hard thinking about yourself, mm -hmm. um, about what it is that you value, about why it is you think you can make a contribution, what kind of contribution you wish to make, if you even want to make one, if you even want to lead. Some really, really hard questions. When I hear that, I don't think authenticity. I think self-awareness. Well, you, you can't have authenticity. That's where I was going. So it, you cannot have uh, self-awareness if you, sorry, you do not, you cannot have authenticity mm -hmm. without building self-awareness mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. Because if you do not have a very, very firm sense of self, then what is authenticity? Mm -hmm. it, it's something probably borrowed, copied, uh, emulated, mm -hmm. uh, or probably the worst is, Something you see someone else do, and you think you should be that too. Mm -hmm. That's the that that that'll kill your leadership development. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine that would be very, very fundamentally uh, incorrect. But often in Japan, they're copying the seniors, so it's probably quite a topical thing here. So, if we think about your work, one of the big areas uh, is another big buzzword is engagement. You know, and uh, we know that. Gallup organization, they do these global engagement surveys, and they usually, Japan is usually around about highly engaged percentages, around about six, seven, can we, it vary, actually it's going down a bit in Japan, but still five, six, seven percent really engaged workforce. I have a bit of a problem with some of these engagement surveys on the mm -hmm. wording and often the translation, but let's just put that aside. 
Uh, it is a topical issue and it's topical everywhere. What have you seen that's been working here or for getting leaders, uh, getting engagement from their teams? What's, what's working? What are some things people could be doing? So engagement is, uh, you know, basically the way I would define engagement is how how much do you look forward to going to your job? And when mm -hmm. you're at work, how stimulated do you feel, mm -hmm. right? And I think in order for those things to, to be realized for people, anyone, not in a, a certain culture or country, I think it's just human, mm -hmm. um, people need to feel seen and heard as individual contributors to a mm -hmm. workplace. Mm -hmm. And I think that's more true now than it, it it maybe was when during the 20th century we were forming these huge organizational structures um, that that seemed very exciting in themselves. You mm -hmm. know, the, the fact of, oh, we're building, there's this big company and has a big office building and I get to sit at this desk and answer this phone. I mean, I think for, for a certain generation of people, that was really, you know, a social innovation. That was a sense of, you know, oh, I've, I've got a good job now, right? Mm -hmm. I've got this workplace, I've got this phone, I've got this, you know, person helping me over there, you know. But now, you know, we, we need much more to feel stimulated in our workplaces and, and we, we need much more uh, interaction. Uh, we, we, we need um, to feel that our supervisor, wh whoever it is who's kind of directing our work, um, knows where we're coming from. And I think that is the big new demand. I mean, there are many new demands on leaders now, but I think this is the main one. And I think that probably um, big, large organizations have been the slowest at picking up on this. And they've, they've tried to provide, for example, uh, employee um, engagement activities. Um, and that's not wrong, you know, that, that's fine. But I just think there's no substitute for feeling personally valued in your workplace. Are you doing business with Japan? Do you really know how things work? Japan Business Mastery provides the answers. Do you have the right networks and know how to create them? Do you know how to get on the same wavelength with Japanese buyers? Do you know what being trustworthy looks like from the Japanese perspective? Japan Business Mastery is based on more than 30 years experience in Japan and will become your go-to guide. Want to succeed in Japan? Buy Japan Business Mastery now. If you want to be successful as a leader, do the Leadership Training for Managers course. All companies need people who can both manage and lead. Leading people screams out for real skills in communication Dealing with all different types of people, being excellent at innovation, planning, delegation, handling mistakes, doing performance reviews really well, and inspiring and motivating the team. Do the Leadership Training for Managers course now in either Japanese or English. And that's interesting because in the, in the typical Japanese hierarchical system, you are start at the bottom, you have no value, and you get value as you get experience and as you rise through the ranks and as you go around the different sections of the company and you do this sort of generalistic uh, approach, right? So in terms of uh, the boss suddenly switching gears here and thinking outside of that hierarchical structure and thinking, well, actually, I need to engage my team, I need to get ideas from my team, uh, I need to get different perspectives from them. I need them to speak up. I need them to feel comfortable to speak up. I need them to be able to disagree with me even though I'm the boss. All that sort of stuff is, is quite a challenge, I think, here when you're in a very hierarchical structure. So what's your, your views on that? It's not possible to change an organization too fast. Mm -hmm. And 
even harder than changing an organization is changing people's mental models about their work and their mm -hmm. role in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't have high expectations of being able to affect that scale of a change mm -hmm. um, very, very quickly. At the same time, I do think it's important to acknowledge the need for the change first mm -hmm. and to make very clear and explicit mm -hmm. the direction that for example, you would like to take your team. Mm -hmm. it, it has to be explained very clearly. Mm -hmm. It can't just be kept implicit. Mm -hmm. In Japan, so much interaction and communication is implicit, yeah. right? But I think with this, anything having to do with change, I think you just have to be very, you have to make all that tacit stuff very, very explicit. Mm -hmm. um, this is, you know, linking back to uh, the school of... Uh, thinking that is um, very important to uh, Hito Subashi ICS, which is knowledge creation and, and this importance of both tacit and explicit knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, and and for, for making organizational change, I think it's not something you can kind of, you can kind of slip into someone's drink. It, it, it has to be something that they can look and see the change mm -hmm. and then decide whether or not they want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. It has to be a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, I think this is a good idea and this is how I'm going to help. So that, that painting of the picture of what the future is going to look like is a high level of communication skill. And I'm guessing that, you know, this is something if leaders are really going to be effective in getting that engagement, then their communication skill is going to have to be very, very polished. Yes. Well, we're talking about vision right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you have a, an ideal or a picture of how you'd like the future to look, uh, you know, in your team, for your, your division, your organization, that vision has to be expressed very clearly. Mm. Uh, and vision can be operational at many, many different, and should mm -hmm. be operational at many, many different levels. Um, in terms of communication, it has to be repeated. It has to be multimedia approach mm -hmm. uh, it has to be it has to be conversed about uh, in every kind of mode and media you, medium you can think of for communications you know it could be um, you know casual discussions uh, at coffee break it could be uh, you know the the intranet you know whatever the platform the company uses. It could be um, frequent addresses by you know members of the of the executive team. Mm -hmm. So so you have to really you know be very very um, intentional and thoughtful about what are all the different ways we need to try to capture people ima people's imagination. Mm. One thing too, you know, if you've got engagement, then you're on the road to getting creativity and ideas because if you're not engaged, you don't care whether it's a better mousetrap we're building here or not, you just don't care. But if you do care, you've got that engagement, then that opens the door for creativity, innovation. So what things have you seen that have been effective for companies to get the ideas out of the people? Because in that hierarchical structure, the ideas often come from the top. So how do we get the ideas from the bottom? How do leaders really harvest the rich idea base that is there inside their people? What have you found that works well? Actually, in, in my experience, I have found that that um, in Japanese companies, um, some ideas come from the top, but many, many ideas, especially practical problem-solving ideas, mm -hmm. come from the teams. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, but I'd like to go back to something we alluded to earlier, which mm -hmm. is um, personal individual value okay. and creativity. So one of my favorite um, educators who's famous is Ken Robinson. And he, um, I think the, the book that I'm referring to is the one he wrote called Out of Our Minds. And um, <laughs> he makes the case that we don't cultivate creativity in children mm -hmm. as they go through the school system. 
they're actually born with all the creativity they need for mm -hmm. their entire lifetimes. And slowly we take it out of them. You strip it out of them. Yeah. And, and I really like that, um, mm. that kind of um, theory and applying it also to maybe uh, corporate culture. Because I think when very, very often when someone joins an organization, they have many, many ideas and uh, you know, points of anticipation or, or hopes, maybe even dreams, about things that they might accomplish in that organization. And then they start, and then I'm not talking about Japanese or any other, I'm just talking about any organization. Then they come into the organization and they are trained, they are, um, given the score, they are told the rules, um, they have to learn a set of accepted behaviors and ways of thinking. And I understand the need for those um, factors and, and those influencers, but at the same time, there is likely something lost mm -hmm. in the process. And I think the challenge for leaders now is to keep organizational culture strong, mm -hmm. um, rooted in important things, but also allow individuals to gain a sense of their capacity to shape the organization also. Mm, interesting, you know, in typical Japanese organizations, the, as I said before, the sort of newest, youngest person has got zero value conceptually from the top leadership's point of view because you haven't been here long enough, you haven't done anything, you haven't learned anything, what could we actually hear from you? And so when they get into meetings, they tend to be just sitting there very passively listening, not contributing. But that young person may be in that room the most uh, technically advanced person in terms of the current tech we use. They might be the closest to the consumer or the buyer of the particular product or service mm -hmm. that the company is actually creating mm -hmm. and delivering, yet they're not really involved. So I think there's a big opportunity there, as you say, for the leaders to not discriminate based on status of when you got here and how old you are, but to actually look for ideas and get that harvest out. But that often doesn't tend to happen here, unfortunately. Uh, actually, I, I disagree. I think mm -hmm. I think that many uh, companies in Japan um, are are understanding that the young generation has changed, mm -hmm. has different expectations for their role in the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I would say that I, I I'm not sure I agree with the assessment of the the organization not seeing that not, not attributing value to young new recruits, I think it's rather that they are, I, I think they view them as having personal value mm -hmm. and potential. I do think so. Yeah. Blank sheets but, of paper seems to be a very common idea. They're a blank sheet of paper and we're going to, craft them through our company over time. Yes. That seems to be a sort of basic idea. Yes, but at the same time, they will relate very much to, for example, where that person may be from in Japan. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll want to know where that person went to school. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there is some kind of, you know, there, there is some kind of a... Um, set of preferences or way that Japanese companies think about talent mm -hmm. that that it that I would say is you know not so much what I have experience of mm -hmm. but I wouldn't say it's non-existent well I think too I mean you've got this you you meet Japanese people you know and they're in some role and you ask them what they studied at university it's in Japan it's very rare actually quite rare that what they're doing now is what they actually studied at university, whereas in the West there's usually a pretty strong alignment between I studied this and I'm now working in this field. And that's why I'm getting back to this sort of, you know, there are 
a malleable resource that we're going to work on and we have a we only take kids from these schools you know universities and therefore like Isotsubashi so we know we're getting kids who are smart uh, they've gone through the system they got to a certain point and we're going to build on that Jody you know let's talk about trust a little bit because the uh, definition you gave before about the invitation to engage in change that requires a lot of trust on the part of the lead with the with the leader mm -hmm. What have you seen works really well in, uh, in building trust? Building trust takes time. Mm. Uh, and for different kinds of people, it takes longer. I think one of the things that I see in my students um, that is one of the greatest points of diversity uh, across, across them is their inclination to trust another person. That's all different. Um, some people find it easy. Other people who have had different life stories find it difficult to trust. So, you know, you can't just kind of look at a group of people and say, I'm going to build trust with my team. It doesn't really work that way. It has to be a series of interpersonal exchanges, um, not all the same, but calibrated to what, what do I think will help that person trust me? Mm -hmm. What 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 do I what can I do or say that would support that person in their effort to trust me? Mm. And and I think that's a respectful way of trying to build trust because trust is not something that we can just expect to get because we have a certain position or a certain mandate. Uh, so so I mean. When you talk about trust in a business context, um, it's kind of interesting, right? Because um, business is not like a pure relational, human relational endeavor. Um, one, of, one of my favorite um, cases uh, of, of leadership is the, is the old classic Harvard Business School case about James Burke and the Tylenol poisonings mm -hmm. in the 1980s. It's, yeah. it's one of my favorites. And, <laughs> and James Burke was a really, really wonderful person. And he was asked, um, you know, very, very often about, um, about ethics, of course, given what happened, uh, and with, with the Tylenol poisonings. And he said, you know, we can talk all day about ethics, but what's really, really important is trust, you know? And, and so you think like, actually trust is a pathway to ethics, right? And maybe some people think about it as the other way around, but I think in order to create an ethical culture, for example, in a workplace, you need an awful lot of trust. Mm -hmm. So, and that all is about bilateral relationships, not one person, of, one person kind of hub and spoke, you know? Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's all bilateral. So, um, and another point that James Burke said was, you know, um, that he, he, he had a long career, very, very successful career in business. You know, he was the CEO of Johnson & Johnson. Uh, but he said, I've always believed there was something a little bit unethical about business. And I love his honesty there because that's what I was alluding to when I say, when you talk about trust in a business setting, it's almost like you've got this hurdle to overcome, right? Because the, the purpose of our coming together is not to be happy and, and, and joyful in each other's presence. The point of us coming together here in a workplace is to help the organization succeed, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's not really a purely human relationship. Mm -hmm. there, there's, a, there's a transactional element to it that, that must be acknowledged. And I think in order to, for, for leaders to, to be credible and therefore build trust with other individuals, they need to be very, very clear about what the standards and expectations are in that transactional business oriented realm of how those people are gonna be interacting. So we can't kind of gloss over that part. We have to be very clear about why we're here, right? Mm. 
And, and then from there, it's much, much easier to have actual real conversations with human beings mm. uh, about how we're going to um, get along. Just thinking about some advice for people who are going to be sent to Japan. They don't speak Japanese. They don't really know Japan in any sort mm -hmm. of depth. They should read my book, Japan Business Mastery, by the way. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm just putting a plug for my own book there for written for those people. But presuming they haven't read that book and they don't know what to do, what would be some advice that you would give people who are newly transferred to Japan? They're going to be here three to five years probably, run the organization in Japan. What would be some things they should be aware of? I think, um, you know, because – so I, I'm an American and um, – I'm from Philadelphia, and you know you you can't beat that out of me. Uh, it, it it rises to the surface. <laughs> um, so as an Aussie, I got no idea what uh, I'm it, from Philadelphia it, it actually means, means. What does that mean? It means very assertive, loud, oh, okay. um, and <clears throat> a little bit like Australians actually, and and um, not very. Um, in, maybe in some ways, not so concerned with refinement. Right. Uh, okay. So so. Um, you know, that rises to the top, you know, uh, with me. And I find that in Japan, sometimes that can confuse people. So, for example, in... So what you're saying is a new leader coming in who's coming from a different type of environment where assertiveness, openness, directness is part and parcel of the culture, they turn up here, they're going to have a different reaction yeah. here. Is that what we're talking kinda, about? Yeah, I mean, you, I think you got you have to kind of go in low. Um, I think, mm -hmm. you know, w one thing that's very important for Japanese teams is to have a sense that they're, the, the person leading them or supervising them is competent. Mm -hmm. That's very, very important. And sometimes if a person from outside Japan comes and is super friendly and buddy-buddy with the team right away, mm -hmm. it might serve to erode a little bit the team's confidence in their confidence in his or her com competence. Mm. So so I'm not saying, you know, be cold. It's important to be to be friendly, but remember it's a workplace mm -hmm. and people will respect your respect of the workplace mm -hmm. and your elevation of Okay, this is the gamba. This mm -hmm. is where we work. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, we're here for a purpose. Mm -hmm. That should very, very much be communicated. Uh, your competence, um, you, you should very humbly um, tell your team what you've been doing. They will want to know your background. They will want to know your qualifications, why you've been appointed to this role. That's very important. Uh, and um, I wonder if people think to do that. I'm just thinking about myself, you uh, know, in the cases where I... I took over teams. Did I ever give any sort of background on what I'd done and why I'm here and why I should be here? I don't actually remember doing any of that. I think I just sort of came in and tried to understand what's going on and then try to influence things. But that's a good point. That's probably something I think back to. I should have done that, actually. Yeah, good point. Well, it's just about them knowing who you are and, and, mm -hmm. and be showing your willingness to explain to them who you mm -hmm. are, who you are and, and kind of what drives you. I think that's very refreshing for them and and helps break down maybe some of the cultural barriers that they might be feeling. I think there's always that doubt too about competence because, mm -hmm. you know, you find it. Any any sort of research we do, we do global surveys you know, on leadership and number of topics, right? If we don't have a Japan component in that research, that research is just rejected here straight away because they look straight away, is Japan included in the number of countries? Japan's not in there. Well, that research is irrelevant because this is Japan and it's different. Mm -hmm. So this is the idea of competence, mm -hmm. right? Okay, you might have known how to do things in Europe. You might have yeah. known how to do things in uh, yeah. you know, Latin America or America, whatever. Yeah. Big deal. This is yeah. Japan, buddy. We do things differently here. Your competence is not transferable. It's not transportable. That's always going to be an element there, I think. I think this is one of the major, I mean, J Japan has many, many wonderful qualities, but I think this is one of their uh, major constraints. Um, they, in Japan, you know, my experience has been um, not a lack of respect at all for what companies and people outside Japan have done. It's just a lack of applicability mm. that they perceive. And so... Um, 
I, I do believe that Japan's at a point now where they, they probably need to start losing that assumption now.、Mm-hmm. And they need to be engaging themselves much more、uh, openly globally.、Mm-hmm. They need to be in an open dialogue with the rest of the world about、mm-hmm. what their strong points are,、mm-hmm. what their points of learning and growth are.、Um, Japan needs to communicate its soul. To the world.、Uh, and I'm actually working on a couple of projects to try and help do that.、Um, but but I, that, this has actually become a little bit of my own personal purpose at, since I'm here.、Um, and I've come to learn you know, to appreciate Japan in many ways.、Um, I'm also, I have a front row street,、uh, seat to some of its constraints.、Uh, and so I'm, I'm really encouraging. Uh, Japanese leaders to、um, you know, engage with counterparts outside Japan. Which I think, you know, realistically, hardly happens at all. I mean, you know, even though we may be in matrixed organizations where the reporting lines can be global, right? And this is a new trend over a number of decades now, but、uh, it's, yeah, Japanese work within those matrices, but I've never really got the sense that they were actually keen about it,、uh, in f a v o r of it, or trying to actually really learn from it. It's sort of they're putting up with it, but they want to have, like, Japan's over here. Yeah, we've got a thing over here. It's always going to be different here. Nice what you're talking about. Can't really apply that here. As opposed to, okay, what could I, what could I see that you're seeing that I can anticipate will be useful in the future for Japan? Don't get a lot of sense of that. Well, you know, it's a form of exceptionalism, and, and I have been exposed to exceptionalism in every single country I've lived in.、Right. I, I don't think that exceptionalism is unique to the US or Japan or any other place.、Right. Every place I've worked, like including Russia and Belgium and, you know, just a very, you know, mostly Western countries, but I've always heard the same story of, well, you know, that doesn't really work here because of X, Y, and Z. And so I don't, I don't want to make too much of this,、uh, this you know, factor, but I do think it, has, it is a, a long standing constraint in the mental models of Japanese managers and leaders that, that, they, they, will, that they will kind of take something and kind of customize it to their own liking. And, and That's not wrong. And if, you know, sometimes it works. So that's fine. But I just think what is being lost is their potential to contribute to the global conversation, for example, on capitalism, which is, which is、um, very, very timely. You know, you have, it's almost like the rest of the world has discovered stakeholder capitalism.、Um, And, and it wants to talk about it. But of course, Japan's been practicing it for you know, a couple hundred years. So, so I, I think you know,、um, Japan actually has a lot to say right now. So、um, if, they would, if they could articulate, refine and articulate a message,、uh, and if they could get that message across, I think that people would start to view Japanese organizations differently. So,、uh, yeah, what are some other advice you'd give for people who are going to be sent to Japan? Well, of course, it depends on the organization that you're going to be you know, part of when you, when you come here.、Um, if, you're, if you're going to be part of a global company in Japan, I would say you are going to be living in a bubble.、Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not in that bubble because I work for a Japanese university in business school. But I think, you know, with all due affection for the people I know who are in that bubble, it, it is a, it's very, very easy to fall into tracks of thinking about Japan, about Japanese people, about Japanese companies. And it's very easy to start stylizing your facts. And I would caution them against doing so. What do you mean by stylizing their facts? Making generalizations、mm-hmm. about Japan, its companies, its people that are maybe 
old, maybe mm. outdated. Mm -hmm. um, I think young Japanese people are very, very different from most of the, the you know, my generation, you know, the 50 plus, mm -hmm. um, very, very different people with very, very different aspirations, values, dreams for the future, conceptualizations of how they see their life path, mm -hmm. uh, clearing. So, so that, you know, I really need to, I would caution against just, just diversify. I would say to those people, have a diverse network, you know, mm -hmm. get out there and, and, and just, um, Cultivate yourself in the in in a in a holistic way about Japan, and then if you're going into a Japanese company, I would say hold on to your hat <laughs> because you're going to be put in a place where people are going to think about leadership in a very very different way, and over time you may be able to influence the way that they think about leadership. But in order to do that, you're going to have to connect with them first. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to <clears throat> respect them for the things that they know, for the things that they've achieved, uh, and see them for what they are contributing each and every day. If you can do that first, I think you've got a chance of making some change. Um, and also, I would say to you, if you're going into a Japanese organization, look for what inspires you about a Japanese company. Mm -hmm. I work very closely with, with the Japanese company, and I see a lot that inspires me. Mm -hmm. And it's very important for our sense of for our worldview to have a, a cultivated and rich worldview and not to fall into this kind of binary thinking about mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. and organizations that, that we constantly challenge ourselves to not um, get stuck hmm. in and stay in one place and stop evolving in a sense of, of how we see things. Hmm. Well, on that note... We'll wrap it up. So thank you very much, Jody. It's a great thank pleasure you, having Greg. you today. So please join us again for our next episode of Japan's top business interviews. <laughs>